the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and I'll try and make it as brief as possible, is a land that was established actually upon Tawheed. It was established upon Tawheed approximately two and a half centuries ago. Since that time, we are currently in the third state of the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. It has been, it was removed by the actions of the enemies of Tawheed and enemies of the Sunnah twice already, and then it was re-established in the 1920s under the leadership of Malik Abdul Aziz, the father of the present king of the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the father of King Salman, also the father of King Abdullah before him, also the father of King Fahad before him, and so on. So the final uh, incarnation of the, of the kingdom of Saudi Arabia has been ruled by the father or the founder of the new state of the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Malik Abdul Aziz, rahimahullah, and then after that, all of his sons. And now it is been ruled by King Salman, hafidhullah ta'ala, bin Abdul Aziz. Now, as for the kingdom itself, then the kingdom rules by the Sharia law. It is an Islamic state. It is a dawla Islamiyah. It has a court system that is based upon Islam. Its laws and its rules and its regulations are based upon Islam. Its university, it has the best and the most widespread universities that they are in any Islamic country in the world. It has masajid. Of course, it is the home of the Haramain, the Haram in Mecca and the Haram in Medina. It has the greatest of the Islamic scholars in the world today. This nation receives attacks or is attacked from every direction. At the present moment in time, without going into history, but this present moment in time, it, has been, it is threatened on two borders. From the southern border, by the Houthi terrorist Rafida Shia, that have been funded by Iran, the Republic of Kufr and Taghut, the Rafida Shia, who there, which is of course the Republic of Iran that was established in the late 70s, I think 1979, under the leadership of Ayatollah Khomeini, or Ayatul Shaitan Khomeini, whom the scholars collectively, without, upon consensus, declared him to be an apostate, a kafir, murtad, because of the fact of his statements regarding the Qur'an, and regarding the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, and regarding the Imams of the Rafi Shia. So they declared him to be a kafir because he said that in fact our Imams have a greater station than the Prophets of Allah. Where the Prophets, they only stopped at the shores of an ocean. Our Imams, he said, they have entered and swum in the oceans or they have embarked into the oceans. He said that the Imams of the Shia that they control every atom of the universe and they do not bring death to, and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot bring death to them and so on. And they believe that the Quran that is with the people of Sunnah, it is a Quran that is deficient and there are verses and chapters from the Quran that are missing and they are only with them. So they have added to the Quran and called, for example, Surah Al-Wilaya. So the Houthis of Yemen that have caused the revolution and the rebellion and the bloodshed and the killing in Yemen that has been going on for, for two or three years now, funded by Iran, in order to enter into the southern peninsula of the Arabian Peninsula and therefore become a threat against the land of Tawheed and this Islamic State, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia that has been ruled, walillahi alhamd, upon, upon Islam and Sharia. Per perfect? No. But you will not find perfection, barakallahu feekum. But it is... Adawla Islamiyya. It is an Islamic state. And it is ruled by Muslims. And it is upon Tawheed. And there are many examples that I can give with regard to the Sharia law in the Kingdom of Saudi, Islamic courts, and so on. And upon its other borders, upon the more northern borders, then it is being attacked by ISIS and the Khawarij. So they have been threatened by, on both sides. Then on top of that, that they, have, that they have huge amounts of refugees that are coming in from Syria because they share a border. And those refugees are being looked after by the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia in their millions. In fact, there is no country in the world whose people, individually the people have donated, the population itself, have donated more generously than the population of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia towards the refugees and towards those who are suffering in Syria. And Saudi Arabia also 
has waged war against ISIS, a jihad, by the way. We call this jihad, fi sabilillah. When Saudi Arabia declared war against ISIS and those terrorists who are the khawarij, worse than the khawarij of old, this Daesh, that the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, with the backing of its scholars, such as Sheikh Al-Fawzan and Sheikh Al-Luhidan and the Lajna, and likewise the scholars of Medina, Sheikh Abdul Muhsin, Sheikh Rabi', Sheikh Ubaid, Sheikh Muhammad, that the scholars of this kingdom, that they authorize that there is a jihad against the Khawarij, ISIS, in Syria. And likewise, that they also issued fatawa, that there is jihad against the Houthis. So yes, this kingdom of Tawheed, and this dawla of Tawheed, and Sunnah, and Salafiyyah, that was established with a pact between Muhammad bin Saud, going back to the 18th century, or before the death of Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab who died in 1206 after the Hijrah. That that pact was based upon Islam and Tawheed and Sunnah. So he gave his bay'ah to Muhammad bin Saud rahimahullah, the Imam. And both of them, they spread da'wah to Salafiyya that began in a village, Dir'iyya. And then within one generation, the whole of the Arabian Peninsula, as far afield as Karbala in Iraq, where they reached and they demolished the graves where the Rafida and the Sufis used to worship. And they leveled the grave of Hussein bin Ali, radiallahu anhuma. A land that was established to demolish shirk and to establish tawheed and to establish the sharia. This land now is being criticized by whom? By the enemies of sunnah. By the enemies of salafiyyah. By the enemies of the sharia in reality. It is not sharia that they want. It is power and authority, and the throne that they want. That's why they want to dethrone the kings. They want to dethrone the kings because they want the throne. Otherwise, why would you fight and rebel and speak against this kingdom? Why would you do it? Who was the, who was the most vociferous in supporting the Arab Spring? The Kuffar in the West. In fact, to the point that when the rulers of the kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the rulers of the Arab lands, whether it be Egypt, whether it be Bahrain, whether it be Kuwait, in all of these lands, that they stopped and they tried to stop the Arab Spring. Why did they try and stop it? Because they knew, the rulers knew, and the scholars knew. Sheikh Abdullah Bukhari, he said, Hafidhullah Ta'ala from the scholars of Medina, he said, before even... They started marching in the streets and the word filtered out that they were going out marching. We said to them, stay in their houses. And the scholars said, stay in your houses. This is not the way to bring about rectification. And they came out marching anyway. And then the Western liberals and those who have been affected by that sickness of the West. That they went in and they said to the people and they said to the governments, let the people march. If you do not let them march, and if you do not let them rally, and if you do not dem let them demonstrate in, the, in Liberation Square, Tahrir Square, in Cairo, in other places, we will establish sanctions against you. So the countries themselves, they try to stem the flow of the demonstrations because we know that behind these demonstrations are individuals who will come after they have used these individuals as just, you know, they are just lambs to the slaughter. Just awam, juhal, the baker, the engineer, the mechanic, the street cleaner. These people are on the front line, lambs to the slaughter. Once they have fallen, now will come through the ones who want to grab the throne. And they want to grab the positions of power. And this is what happened in Syria, in Libya, in Tunisia, in other places. And you see from the ashes of the burning cities of Syria and Iraq and of Libya, what has arisen now? A sect, barakallahu feekum, the likes of which we have not seen, possibly in hundreds of years in terms of its extreme, in terms of its extremism and its violence against Islam and the Muslimin, Daesh. These individuals, that's why Sheikh, the, 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 the scholar and the mufti of the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Sheikh Abdul Aziz, Allah Sheikh Hafidhullah Ta'ala, he said that behind Daesh is the plots of the enemies of Islam itself. They are the ones who gave them the fuel 
and gave them the strength to do what they are doing. How has Islam benefited? And now they want to criticize Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is at the forefront of the conduct of Saudi Arabia and its scholars, its rulers, its leaders, its ministers, and its scholars, and its institutions are at the forefront of condemning terrorism and have been. When the West was still looking on and the lands of Islam were being bombed by the terrorists, going right back to 1998 and 97, and even before that, Sheikh Abdulaziz bin Baz did nothing less, as far as from that writing that you can see, did nothing less than make takfir upon Osama bin Laden. When he said, Osama bin Laden, and, and Osama bin Laden and those with him, that they do not believe in Allah, and they do not believe in the last day. So if anything, maybe short of takfir, but close to it, or takfir itself. 1998, the head of the legend, Sheikh Abdulaziz bin Baz, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. Now this land is being targeted from every direction by its enemies. And in reality, this land should be helped and supported. Where are the great scholars of the Ummah coming from today? From Medina, from Riyadh, from Samitha, from these places. The scholars of Hadith, the scholars of Fiqh, the scholars of Sunnah. Those who give you fatawa morning and, morning and evening. When the Adhan is called in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, in any city, town or village, every shop and business has to close at the time of Adhan. Up until the prayer is prayed, and then they can return back to their businesses. Someone said to Sheikh Al-Fawzan, Hafizahullah Ta'ala, this uh, a Q&A that I heard only the other day, about two days ago, they said to him, oh Sheikh, there are people who are saying that the businesses should not be closed for the Adhan. He said that this has been now said. He said, Ya Akhi, don't listen to the kuffar. Look, because he thinks that only a kafir would say this. He said, Ya Akhi, don't listen to the kuffar. Because we Muslims, we pray. So the business is up to how can you leave your business open, the shop is running, and you're praying at the same time? What are you doing? This is a land, Barakallahu Fikum, only last week executed how many? 47 terrorists. Now you find these liberals and human rights people coming out. No, you're not supposed to execute them. From the West. Only we're allowed to do that by bombing them. Alright? But you're not allowed to execute them. This land, it has a program for the rehabilitation of terrorists. It has a program of de-radicalization. It has a program where they will go to the prisons. The scholars of Sunnah will go to the prisons and give da'wah to those who have been affected by the ideas of the, of the Irhabiyun, from the ideas of the terrorists, from the ideas of Sayyid Qutb. This land that has banned the teaching of the books of Sayyid Qutb and Hassan al-Banna and Ikhwan al-Muslimin, this land that has banned as an organization Ikhwan al-Muslimin from its country. Why? Because Ikhwan al-Muslimin was behind the Arab Spring and the revolutions. Ikhwan al-Muslimin. Saudi Arabia, out of his generosity and its kindness towards other Muslims, in the time when Jamal Abdel Nasser had executed uh, Sayyid Qutb and he had imprisoned the Brotherhood and the leaders of the Brotherhood, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia said, well, these are our brothers who are in prison. Okay, Sayyid Qutb bad, yes, and all of this we accept. But now innocent people are going to prison, so they opened their doors and they accepted Ikhwan al-Muslimin into the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. As brothers, we'll look after you, you're Muslims. And for three decades, they worked to cause rebellion and change the mindset of the youth of the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Out of that came Salman al awda and Safra al-Hawali, who were students of Muhammad Qutb, who was given refuge in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Muhammad Qutb was given refuge in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia after the execution of his brother Sayyid Qutb. So these individuals, they planted themselves in this kingdom instead of being grateful. Let's aid this nation. This is a land of Tawheed. This is a land of Sunnah. Let's not start a rebellion here. What did they do? 
They raised two generations, if not three generations, upon the thinking of Sayyid Qutb and Ikhwan al Muflisin. And when did it come out? First Gulf War, not the second Gulf War, the first Gulf War. That began in 19, uh, around about 89 through to 91. When Saddam Hussein, Saddam Hussein, this Kafir, Mulhid, communist, Marxist, Ba'athist, entered Kuwait, slaughtered his people, took their wealth, and exiled the rest. This Saddam. Even then, it was the kingdom of Saudi Arabia that came to the aid of the Kuwaitis. They made a pact with the Americans because they knew that they don't have the ability to conquer and to remove the enemies from Kuwait. So Saudi Arabia, they made a pact and they allowed the American bases to be established in Saudi Arabia in case Saddam Hussein would make an attack against the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, which he did. <coughs> and Sheikh Abdul Aziz bin Baz at that time gave the fatwa to allow the Americans in. Because it is permitted for a Muslim to seek the aid of a non-Muslim in the defense of Islam and the Muslimin. And the fuqaha of al-Islam for centuries have spoken about this. And we've mentioned it in many lectures, the proofs, the proofs and the evidences that establishes. Now you find those khawarij and those ikhwan and those muflisun who make takfir upon the kingdom of Saudi Arabia and Sheikh bin Baz for allowing the Muslims to cooperate with the non-Muslims against an enemy who is going to attack, Muslim, attack Islam and the Muslimin. Saddam Hussein was a kafir. Sheikh Abdul Aziz bin Baz declared him to be a kafir back in the 1970s. Because this man was a Ba'athist, Marxist. So when he entered into Kuwait, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia took measures to protect itself. And when he attacked Saudi Arabia by, by, by firing Scud missiles into the kingdom, Saudi Arabia defended its borders with the aid of the alliance. And what did Ikhwan al-Muslimun do at that time and the Qutubiyin and the Sururiyin? The likes of Safar and Salman and Abdul Rahman, Abdul Khaliq and all of these individuals. Abdul Rahman Abdul Khaliq, who? The leader and the religious head of Ihya al turath al-Islami. Up until today, they started speaking against the scholars, against the fatwa of Sheikh Abdul Aziz bin Baz, making sly and snide attacks against the rulers. So they supported Saddam Hussein, the Ba'athist communist, over this land of Tawheed. And yet they say that we are people of Sunnah. Yeah, and then you have Muhammad Surur with his Majallat al-Sunnah that he published from Birmingham. You look at Maktaba Salafi at the bookstore, across the road is a street called Langley Street. On Langley Street, there is a building. That building there is where Muhammad Surur's printing press was. He was established there. He used to publish his magazine there. Thereafter, they established a masjid in London, Muntada al-Islami, the organization that was established by Muhammad Surur Zain al-Abideen. This Syrian who left Syria went to Saudi Arabia. In Saudi Arabia, he taught and was sitting with the likes of Safra Hawali Salman al awda Eventually, he moved to Kuwait. From Kuwait, he was exiled into London. From London, he moved to Birmingham. And he used to sit in Green Lane Masjid, giving circles in the early 90s. And handing out his magazine, Mujallat al-Sunnah, that Sheikh al-Albani used to call Mujallat al-Bid'a. Not a magazine of Sunnah, a magazine of Bid'a. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia banned this magazine. So what did he used to do? He used to get a fax machine, several fax machines. You know, this is pre-email days. Several fax machines and get their workers in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia who had Ikhwan, the thinking of Ikhwan, that had infiltrated the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And literally thousands of faxes used to enter into the kingdom of Saudi Arabia with the fatawa and the rulings of this Muhammad Surur and those who were with him from the takfiris. And then they would read those from the manabir, from the members in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. From his writings, they used to speak against Sheikh Abdul Aziz bin Baz that the scholars of Saudi Arabia are the slaves of the slaves of the slaves and their leaders and their masters are the Jews and the Christians. Talking about Sheikh Abdul Aziz bin Baz. So for years, for decades, these people have been trying to destroy this kingdom. Nothing has changed now. So we make dua for them, day and night, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects it and preserves this kingdom. 
People say to me, Ya Akhi, don't you want an Islamic state? ISIS, look at Islam. Do you, do you want Islam? I say, we have an Islamic state, Barakallahu Fikum. Not one, we have many. Kuwait is an Islamic state. Saudi Arabia is an Islamic state, and the best of them is the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Without doubt. So we have an Islamic state. The Khariji encampment that they have, that's all it is. It is an encampment in Syria that inshallah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will wipe from the earth. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expedite that. These individuals, this Daesh and this organization, in their tweets and in their writings and in their fatawa, you know what they say? We will enter into Riyadh and we will hang your scholars from the lampposts of, of Riyadh. The enmity is towards Sunnah and Salafiyyah. And we will behead your king. This is what they want. So they can establish the Khariji state wherever they can. And Alhamdulillah, Wahhab ibn Munabbih, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, he said, never has a Khariji or the Khawarij ever established a Dawla. Never. With all of their fighting and killing and bloodshed and murder, the killing of women and children and families, young and old, they have never established a Dawla. All they can do is cut off the road here, cut off the pathways there. Never have they been established. So when we say, what does Saudi Arabia do? Look at the pressure that this dollar is under, but it stands steadfast and firm. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed them, walillahi alhamd, blessed them with scholars, with the birth and the upbringing of Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab, rahimahullah ta'ala, and his offspring, and his students, and his grandchildren. From his family, and from his offspring, and from his, from those who benefited from him. And likewise, hand in hand with that, with the rulers, the family of Saud, the house of Saud. The house of Saud, alongside this family of Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab, for two and a half centuries, walillahi alhamd, or two centuries or thereabouts, established the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the dawla that they want to destroy. Yes, it is a land that has sharia. It is also a land that has weaknesses. Just like you and I have weaknesses, barakallahu fi, you can put your hands up if you think that you're perfect. Those murderous shayateen that are operating in Syria in their little enclaves. They will soon come to an end, inshallah. May Allah give victory to the mujahideen of the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, both in Yemen and in Syria. Allah bless this country, bless them with wealth. They were just Bedouins walking from one village to the next, just on camelback. And then something came out of the ground that Allah has never given to any land before this land of the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. A power, black liquid that came out of the ground that has more deposits of oil and crude oil than, and that quality of crude oil more than any country in the world. Allah blessed them with this. Yet they still held on to the sunnah and tawheed. Who could do that? I put 20,000 pounds in the lap of someone. And, ya khi, gone, finished. No salah, nothing. Never see him again. Be it gone. <laughs> <laughs> Look what Allah gave them. And still, what did they do with the wealth? Look what they did. They took the Quran, had it translated into how many languages? Maybe the brothers Abdullah always know better. How many languages they translated it into? You name the language, they translated it. Every language Somali, Albanian, Bosnian, Serbo Croat, Russian, Hindi, Urdu, Bengali. You name the language, they translated it. Free of charge. Since when? Since Barakallahu Fikum from the 1970s, Kitab al-Tawheed used to be distributed by, in Britain and in America, in the English language and in other languages in the, in the, in the Saudi embassies across the world. Kitab al-Tawheed of Sheikh al-Islam Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab back in the 1970s. This is what they used to do and they still do. Millions of mushafs translated into hundreds of languages distributed to millions of people 
funded masajid, hundreds and th literally hundreds and thousands of mosques around the world funded by the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Mosques in Pakistan, mosques in Bangladesh, mosques in Russia, mosques in the Russian republics, mosques across Europe, mosques in Birmingham, mosques in London, in Edinburgh, in Scotland, everywhere around the world, in America. From the wealth of this government. That's why I said, put 20,000 pound in your lap when, when we'll see you again. These people, they had wealth and they spent it in the cause of Allah. Of course. Is there weakness? Find me a person who doesn't have weakness. Sheikh Al-Fawzan was, ah, I remember Sheikh Al-Fawzan, same Q&A I was listening to a few days ago. They said to him, Ya Sheikh, what am I making dua for the ruler? He said that it is a sunnah of Yawm Al-Jum'ah. He said, I don't say it is mubah. I don't say it is something that was done. He said, I say it is a sunnah to make dua for the Muslim rulers. Someone said, then the next question that came, they said to him, oh, Sheikh, what about mentioning their name? He said, mentioning the name, then that is up to you. But making dua is a sunnah and making dua against them is a bid'ah. Because this was the way of the Salaf, making dua against them bid'ah, making dua for them sunnah, barakallahu feek.